church, tell the person next to you it's preaching time. Tell somebody on the other side of you it's preaching time. Get your Bibles in your hand all over the church. Get your copy of God's Word, whatever it is. Get it in your hand now. Hold it tight. Do you not realize that the Bible that you're holding in your hand, from Genesis to Revelation, it reveals God in some way. Every book, every chapter, every verse, God is revealed. He's been different things to different people. If I asked you to testify what God has been to you, the old folk would say, you can't tell it like I can tell it. But everybody can say that God has been something to me. Somebody say he's been a healer. Where are you today? He's been a protector. He's been a provider. All day long, our pastor has been preaching this word. You're getting ready to hear that talks about what God was to the people in the text. And tonight, the choir lets you know God is. the choice.
church. Gave me the victory. Every voice, you don't know. He came down from heaven. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Say, you don't know. You don't know. I dare you to tell the one next to you. If I can't say a word, I'll just let you know I let sweat all over the church. Come on. Stand, take someone by the hand. Just, just take them by the hand. That's important. Take someone by the hand. Gave me the victory. Oh, I love him. God, I love you. God, we come now praying. First and foremost, for the hand that we're holding tonight, we thank you for this hand. Thank you for how you blessed and saved and delivered this hand. Realize, oh God, we're holding the hand of a survivor, the hand of an overcomer, the 
hand of a person that the devil has tried everything and his power to stop, to block, to kill, to destroy, but they made it. So now, God, I gently squeeze this hand as confirmation that the worst is behind them and that the best is yet to come. I squeeze it one more time as confirmation that their ladder shall be greater. Now, God, be glorified in this place. I pray as we are on the doorstep of a brand new year that these last few minutes of this year that you will allow us to hear this word unencumbered. I pray that you would even dispatch prayer warriors in this place whose assignment it is to pray as your word is being proclaimed. I confess my faults, my flaws, my sins, my shortcomings, and I pray, God, that you would use me in your service. Think with my mind, speak with my voice, take the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, allow it to be acceptable tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said amen. As you're still standing, thank your neighbor for praying for you. Thank him for praying for you. Come on, thank him for praying for you tonight. Grab your Bibles, stand with me, remain standing, grab your Bibles, come on in, those on the outside, let them squeeze in some kind of way. Amen. I want everybody that can get in, get in. They can sit around the walls, uh, around the steps, Alex, or officers, that's not going to bother me. Go to the book of Exodus, um, chapter number 13, Exodus 13, Exodus chapter 13, and our text is found in uh, verse 17 through 22, and I'm grateful to God for all of our ministers, our elders of our church, uh, these leaders. Thank you for uh, this year of stellar leadership, my beautiful wife, Lady Kim. God bless you, honey, and others, um, visitors who are here. We're grateful to God for um, for for you. Um, get your devices, your Bibles, and open them with me. Again, Exodus 13, um, verse 17 through 22. And I just want to read verse 17 and 18 in your hearing. And when you have it, this is how the word of the Lord reads. It says, so at last, reading from the Living Bible, so at last, Pharaoh let the people go. God did not lead them through the land of the Philistines, although that was the more direct route from Egypt to the promised land. And the reason why was because God felt that the people might become discouraged by having to fight their way through, even though they left Egypt armed. God thought that they might return to Egypt. So God instead led them along a route through the Red Sea wilderness. Stop there. I want to preach um, tonight needing your prayers and God's power simply from these words, how to handle divine audibles. Turn to somebody, look him or her in the eye and say, neighbor, the pastor's going to preach about how to handle divine audibles may be seated in the very presence of the Lord. This is going to make sense in a minute. How to handle divine audibles. Ushers, you may be seated in the very um, presence of, 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 of the Lord. One of my favorite professional football players that I loved watching play, he's retired now. But when he played, I look forward to seeing every game he played. His name is Peyton Manning. I enjoyed watching um, Peyton play. I enjoyed watching him, not because he had the strongest arm in the league. He didn't have the ability to make every throw like an Aaron Rodgers could. I wasn't watching Peyton because I thought that he was the fastest quarterback. He doesn't have the foot speed like a Michael Vick or Drew Brees that could outrun oncoming defenders. I was watching him not because he had such a quick release like a Dan Marino or because he was so strong and an imposing figure in the pocket like a Cam Newton or a Big Ben, but I enjoyed watching this player named Peyton Manning 
simply because he had phenomenal control at the line of scrimmage. You football fans, you, you know what I'm talking about. Peyton Manning, he would break the huddle. He would get to the line of scrimmage. And I got joy watching all of the hand signals and how he would call all these words, Omaha, and this, that, and the other, and how he would look over the opposing defense and how Peyton would change the plays right at the line of scrimmage. Now, for those of you in the building that's not familiar with what an audible is, an audible is when a quarterback breaks the huddle, gets to the line, looks over the opposing defense, and change the play at the line of scrimmage. What's fascinating to me, seeing quarterbacks uh, audible different plays or to a different play, is that when this happened, they don't consult with anybody else on the field or off the field when the quarterback calls an audible. He's not talking to the other teammates. He's not talking to the offensive coordinator in the booth. Please stay with me. When the quarterback calls the audible, he's making an independent decision based on what he sees or senses in the current situation. I mentioned, Mildred, this whole issue of audibles because in our text tonight, God is calling a divine audible. God is changing the play in Israel's life. God has looked over the line of scrimmage of their life, and God has decided that he wants them to take a different route. And just like a quarterback, God didn't ask Moses' permission. God didn't consult with anybody on or off the field. God looked and saw and sensed the situation. And God independently decided it's time for Israel to go a different route. In our text tonight in verse 17, if your Bibles are open, Pharaoh has finally let the children of Israel go. 400 years of Egyptian captivity. 400 years making bricks without straw. 400 years being subservient to hard task masters. 400 years of answering to men that were ungodly. Pharaoh has now finally, don't miss this, let the children of Israel go. They are free. They've left the place of pain and they're marching to the place of promise. At the time of our text, they've left the place of not enough, and they're on their way to the place of more than enough. At the time of our text, they've left behind them what has bound them, and they're marching eagerly to that which is getting ready to bless them. They're on the way. They, they have not made it to Canaan, but they're out of captivity. <laughs> they got a long way to go, but they've come a mighty long way. Can I suggest that where Israel is in the text is where somebody is right now. Listen, you have not reached your final destination, but thank God you're not where you used to be. Thank God you have a long way to go, but on the same token, you've come a mighty long way. Can I suggest that every now and then we have to pause to give God praise for the progress that you've made. I'm talking to somebody now. No, you don't dot every I, you don't cross every T, you're not doing everything that you should do, but thank God you're not doing everything you used to do. <laughs> That's where Israel is. Israel is close to conquering Canaan. In fact, Arthur Pink, who does a wonderful exegesis of this particular perigope, Arthur Pink suggests that where Israel is now is literally 40 days away from possessing the uh, Canaan, please don't miss this. 400 years of captivity now reduced to being 40 days away. 40 days away from better. 40 days away from walking into their destiny. 40 days of going into a place where there will be no more struggle, no more heartache, no more tears. 40 days away from being in a place where they are free from persecution, free from pain, free from hard times and hard task masters, 40 days away from their destiny. However, right before they get there, God decides 
to change the play. Right before they walk in, God decides to call an audible. Right before they reach their final, y'all ain't feeling me. Right before they reach their final destination, God decides to usurp and to exercise his powerful prerogative and change the play. I want to pause and suggest that where Israel is in the passage is where somebody listening to me are in the pew. You are the recipient of some divine audibles. Somebody here, if you were to be honest, you can admit that 2018 has been the year of play changes, that God has called some audibles in your life. If you were to be honest, this past year didn't work out as you expected it to work out. Somebody here has the testimony that God has changed the play. It's frustrating when you and God has huddled and talked about going a certain route. And when you break huddle, God decides to call an audible. What do you do when God takes it upon himself to seemingly block the blessing? What do you do when God seemingly decides, I'm not going to let things work out as planned. I'm not going to let the door open as discussed. I'm not going to let the opportunity manifest as planned. What do you do when God decides that it's not time for you to do this, that, or the other? What do you do when God um, decides it's not time for you um, to walk into your next season? What do you do when God decides to change the play? It's frustrating, I tell you, when you see other um, people uh, receiving their promise. It's frustrating when you see other individuals walking into their next season. It's frustrating when you see other people that have not prayed as powerful prayers that you've prayed. When you see other people who have not been as faithful to God in their time, their talent, their treasure, their testimony. It's frustrating when you see others who have not spent time in their secret war room like you have. It's frustrating when you see others who have not sacrificed um, like you have walking into their next season and God sees your faithfulness God sees your uh, dedication. God hears uh, your prayer. He hears your praise. He sees your commitment to your church. He sees your commitment to your family. And in seeing all of that, God still decides to call an audible. I want to unpack this text tonight because this text tonight is telling to teach us that there's some things you got to do when God calls an and audible. There are some things you got to do when God decides to change the play. You're looking at me, but I want to tell you, if God hadn't changed some plays uh, in your life this past year, don't think um, that you are escaped from having uh, audibles. If God uh, hadn't stepped into your circumstance and your life and God uh, uh, called a divine, uh, don't, don't, don't think um, that you have uh, been, been uh, uh, eliminated, but God has a, a divine audible with your name. Well, Pastor, what do you do when God calls uh, an audible? Three things that this text is telling the teacher. I want to give you all three. When God calls uh, an audible in your life, you have to watch this. Trust uh, what God sees uh, in you. Trust what God has said about you. And thirdly, you have to trust what God has sent to you. Once again, when God calls this audible, write that down. When God calls an audible in your life, you have to trust God. Trust uh, what God sees. Trust what God has said. Trust uh, what God has sent. One more time, when God calls an audible, you have to trust what God has seen in you. Trust what God has said about you. And thirdly, trust what God has sent to you. Let's unpack this text. When you look at our narrative tonight, uh, you discover, as I mentioned, Israel is on their way walking in to better. Touch your neighbor and say they're walking in to better. Canaan, Canaan was a promised land. God, through scripture, promised Israel that he had a place, he had a land that was promised to them. God told them, please don't miss this, God told them, Tumor, I got a promised land for you. 
God promised Abraham. God promised Isaac and Jacob. Three times in scripture, God made promises to the patriarchs of Israel that there was a parcel of land with their name on it. God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, that there was a land reserved for them. He promised Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, verse 3, that there was a land reserved for them. He promised Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, verse 13, that there was a land promised them. However, God did to them oftentimes what God does to us. God didn't tell them the whole story. God told them that the land was promised, but God didn't tell them that the land was possessed. Y'all ain't talking to me. God, God told them that he had a land uh, with their name on it, but God never told them that the land was not uninhibited. God didn't tell them that there were nations that were larger and stronger than Israel residing in the land. God told them, I got a promised land for you, but God didn't tell them the problems that was associated with the promise. In fact, you Bible readers know that Israel did not discover that the land was possessed until Numbers chapter 13 verse 29. The Bible says when those spies came back with the report, the spies told Moses, Moses, it's a good land as God has promised, but there are five nations in the land. Verse 29, they said, Moses, you got the Amalekites uh, that's there in the land dwelling in the south. You got the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites hanging out up in the mountain. You got the Canaanites living down there by the sea. Verse 33. And top of that, you got the sons of Anak hanging out in the land. They are giants. I got the wrong crowd. They are giants in the land. God told them about the promise, but God didn't tell them about the problem. Can I stop to tell you that if God is not talking about the problem, you ought not talk about the problem. Now, somebody right now saying, Pastor Jackson, God God told me about my possession, but God didn't tell me the headache that was going to come with it. God told me about the promise, but God didn't tell me the heartbreak that's going to come. God told me about the promise, but God didn't tell me the fights I'd have to have to get it. God didn't tell me about the floors I'd have to walk, the pain I'd have to endure, the tears I'd have to cry, the burden I'll have to cry of the climb. He didn't tell me about the mountains I'd have to scale, the valleys I have to tunnel through. God told me about the promise, but God didn't tell me about the Come here, child of God. If God didn't tell you about the problem, it was because the problem is not a problem to God. If God ain't talking about the problem, you ought not talk about the problem. Stop telling God how large your problems are and tell your problems how large your God is. Here it is, here it is, here, are y'all still here? Here it is, uh, uh, God saw something uh, in Israel. God saw that Israel was not able uh, to handle uh, these five neighboring nations. Uh, uh, Chantel, God looked at their life. God saw into their situation. God saw that Israel uh, was waiting and wanting to walk into Canaan, but he knew that they were not prepared uh, to handle the opposition uh, that lied therein. Even though Israel thought they were ready. God saw. God knew how much they could handle. Lean this way, child of God. God has called an audible in somebody's life tonight because God has looked into your life and God knows how much you can there. God knew that after 400 years of, of Egyptian captivity, they were not ready to fight another battle. God knew after staying 400 years uh, working uh, in Egyptian captivity, they didn't have the strength to fight five uh, neighboring uh, nations. God uh, looked at their life and God saw that they didn't have what it took, amen, to defeat the Amorites and the Canaanites uh, and the Jebusites 
Amalekites and the Hittites uh, and the uh, uh, Amalek, uh, 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 Amalekites, God looked at their life and God decided uh, even though uh, Canaan is ready for you, you are not ready for Canaan. Who am I talking to in this house? Uh, God told me to tell somebody here under the sound of my voice, uh, he called uh, this audible in your life because he knows uh, how much you can bear. Nudge your neighbor. Tell a neighbor, God knows what you can handle. Come on, tell him again, God knows what you can handle. And because verse 17, God thought that the children of Israel would become discouraged by a defeat. God's faith took it upon himself to give Israel a divine detour. Somebody shout detour. But the detour was not a denial. The detour was for their development. God says, I'm going to call this audible. I'm going to take you a different route because the route I'm going to take you, it won't be a direct route. It'll be a difficult route. And even though the route will take you longer, the route is going to make you stronger. I came to tell somebody in this house, stop complaining about the divine detour and thank God for the development that's going to come as a result. Stop complaining that God has changed the play and start getting excited because when this season is over, you are going to be able to handle some stuff you can't handle now. I'm talking to about 500 people who ought to have a flashback and look back over your life and think about those detours that God took you on and when you came out of the detour how developed you were your praise was more developed your worship was more developed your prayer life was more developed your patience was more developed your stick to was more developed who you were as a husband a father a woman a wife a mother a father a son was more developed so stop complaining about the detour and thank God for the the development uh, because somebody is stronger, you're wiser and you're better and what developed you uh, was the delay somebody shout it was the delay I talk to people all the time Someone say, Pastor Jackson, how do you know you're getting stronger? I say, well, you know you're getting stronger when the stuff that make you laugh, cry, you then uh, makes you laugh now. <laughs> you know that you're getting stronger when the people that got on your nerve then uh, don't even phase you now. <laughs> you, you, you know you're getting stronger when the stuff that used to vex you get on your last nerve. Uh, it's like sleeping aids now. Uh, it helps you go to bed at night. Uh, you know you're getting stronger when you can walk around folk that despise the ground you walk on uh, and keep your head up and roll your shoulders back. Uh, why? Because you know that no weapon formed against you. I got the wrong church. Uh, you know that you're getting stronger when God don't have to remove you from the trouble uh, but you can stand strong in the trouble knowing uh, if God puts you here, God can sustain you here. Is there anybody in this house uh, that can give God a crazy praise? Why? Because you know you're stronger now than you've ever been before. So, Kelvin, when God calls this audible in your life, the first thing you have to do is you have to trust what God sees. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, trust what God sees. Tr trust that God can handle stuff that you can't handle. Trust that God has looked ahead of your life. Lord, help me preach. And God knows what's coming. Every other week, I'm on a plane flying somewhere. I remember recently being on the plane, sitting by the window, looking out the window. It was a wonderful flight. Flight took off on time, no turbulence. I was sitting beside somebody that didn't want to talk. Hallelujah. <laughs> it, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful flight. I was enjoying my flight, looking out the window. It was a wonderful flight. All of a sudden, without warning, I heard a voice over the intercom. The pilot telling us to fasten our seat belts. He commanded the in-flight crew to stop the in-flight service, to put up our table trays and to fasten our seat belts because trouble was on the horizon. I looked out the window. I didn't see a cloud 
in the sky. Help me, somebody. The skies were clear, no clouds. However, he, he heard a voice. Amen, somebody. He, he heard a voice from a tower, and the tower told him that our flight pattern was leading us uh, into some turbulence, and he warned us to fasten our seatbelts because there was somebody else with a different vantage point than he had that told us that trouble was on the horizon. And a few minutes later, I heard, the, the, I felt the plane rattling. I saw the skies turning dark. I saw uh, 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 the, 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 the clouds begin to form. Why? Because somebody that had a different view told us that trouble was on the horizon. Now, stop being mad at God. Whenever God calls an audible, it's because God has seen something. And God is trying to prepare you for what's coming next. Whenever God calls these divine audibles in our lives, first thing we have to do is trust what God sees in us but then secondly we have to trust what God has said about us touch your neighbor and say neighbor trust what God has said about you what I love about the Lord write this down what I love about the Lord is that God always gives us what we need before we need what he's given they're going to put that on the screen write that down God always gives us what we need before we need what God has given one more time God always help me somebody gives us what we need before we need what God has given. And what God has given each and every one of us is a word concerning our lives. Touch your neighbor one more time. Say, neighbor, I got a word. God gave me a word. In verse number 19 in our text, that's what Moses is doing. Moses is walking. He's traveling. Stay with me. On his way to Canaan. And as he's on his way to Canaan, the Bible says in verse number 19 that he's carrying with him the bones of Joseph. Please don't miss that. I know it seems like a strange thing. Please don't miss this. A strange thing for somebody to be carrying. They're carrying the bones of a dead patriarch. They're on their way to, to, to Canaan. They left Egypt. And out of all of the things to carry with them, the Bible says in verse 19 that Moses, are y'all here tonight? Moses Monifa is carrying the bones of Joseph. Strange thing for them to be carrying until you understand why he's doing it. Joseph, my brothers and my sisters, represents a word released in a past season. Somebody shout, a past season. <laughs> That thing shouted at me because I've discovered that sometimes God will give you a word in a past season that will sustain you in a present situation. <laughs> Preach, Pastor Jackson. God will give you a word in a past season that's designed to help you in a present situation. The bones of Joseph represents a word given in a past season. You Bible readers remember when Joseph was pushed into a pit in Genesis chapter 37, verse 24, by his brothers. He spent years in Egypt. His brothers thought they were trying to hurt him, but turns out they were helping him because God can take what the devil meant for evil and flip the script for your good. <laughs> Fifty people should have shouted right there. His brothers thought they were pushing him into a pit, but ultimately they were pushing him into his purpose. Y'all ain't hearing me. Sometimes God will use people as pushers uh, to help push you to your next, I got the wrong church, uh, to help push you to your next, de de next destination. The brothers of Joseph pushed him into a pit. But years later in Genesis chapter 50, write that down, Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, when Joseph was on his deathbed. Joseph released this prophecy. He says something like this. He says, I, I, I'm getting ready to die. I, I'm an old man. I'm getting ready to die. But I got confidence in something. God is going to visit his people. And when God visits his people, God is going to bring them up from this place. And God is going to take them to a land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph said, I'm so confident 
confident that God is going to do it. Verse 25, that when he does it, don't leave my body here in Egypt, but take my bones with you because the God I serve is a God that can't lie. Joseph says, I am confident that God is going to honor his word. And so Moses, don't miss this, as he's leaving Egypt, he carries a word with him. He's carrying a promise that God is going to deliver us. Moses is walking from Egypt, carrying the bones of Joseph, which represents a promise from the Lord that God is going to deliver us and bring us into the promised land. And even though God changed the way, God never changed the word. God told Moses, Moses, I'm going to take you a different right. Moses told the Lord, Lord, take me anywhere you want to take me. But I got a word that when you finish calling this audible, eventually you're going to take me to my final destination. Can I give somebody a reason to shout? Whenever God change your route, you got to trust what God has said about your life. If God has given you a word and told you you were going to be the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower, I don't care how broke you are right now, God eventually is going to flip the script. If God told you you were going to be healed, I don't care what the doctor says. If God said it sooner or later, healing is on the way. If God told you that your tears are temporary, I don't care how much you cry tonight, eventually joy is going to come in the morning. And what I want to know is, is there somebody in this house that know God has released a word over your life. Am I talking to anybody that you know that God has said something about your life? God has prophesied over your life. He told you, you ain't going to be like your mama them. He told you, you're going to rise up from your context. He told you that the devil can't kill you because you are too anointed. Give somebody high five. Say, neighbor, I got a word over my life. feel like preaching tonight. There ain't nothing like knowing what God has said about you. It's, it's nothing like knowing that God has a, 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 a prophetic word over your life. Baby, because when you know God has a prophetic word over your life, you know that setbacks are nothing but set up for comebacks. When you know that God has released a prophetic word over your life, you know that every time uh, uh, you're in a negative situation, folk better look quick because you're coming out of this. Uh, because I know the word that the Lord has spoken over my life. Uh, whenever I cry, I tell my tears, uh, you're temporary. Because I know the word that God has spoken over my life. Uh, whenever I'm going through an adverse season, I tell people, you better look quick because I'm coming up out of this. Uh, whenever I I'm going through trial, and tribulation. I don't trip over the trial because I know the word that's over my life. And if you got a word over your life, lean over and tell your neighbor one more time. You're sitting beside somebody that got a word over their life. That's why I can shout when I'm broke. That's why I can dance when I'm going through. That's why I can come to church and open up my mouth and give God a crazy praise because I got a word One question. Has God said anything about you? Has God said anything prophetic about your life? Come on, talk to me if you can. Is there a word over your children? Is there a word over your grandchildren? Is there a word over your finances? I got the wrong card. Come on, talk to me. Is there a word over your, over your heritage? Is there a word over your household? Is there a word over our church? Come on, talk to me. What's the word? The word is a thousand shall fall on one side, 10,000 on another side, but nothing is going to come to you. The word is no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. The word is weeping and doing for a night, but just is coming in the morning. I'm talking to somebody tonight. God has called an audible. God has 
change the play. You didn't think it was going to be like this. You didn't envision your life going down this path. You envisioned the trajectory of your life a different way. But God changed the play. But God called, Lord, let me preach one more time. God called the honorable. When God calls this honorable sister Caleb, you got to trust that God, what God sees. Trust that God has looked around the corners of my life. God knows what's happening. That's why he didn't let certain relationships work out because he knew how it was going to end. That's why he didn't let you take certain jobs because he knew how it was going to end. That's why he didn't let you leave when you were trying to go because he knew how things were going to turn out. Trust. What God has seen, trust what God has said about you. But then you got to trust what God has sent to you. Whenever God, are y'all still here? Whenever God calls an audible in your life, you have to trust that God has given you what you need to survive. There's something I discovered. I promise I'm almost done. There's something I discovered to me that, that whenever um, God calls plays, changes to play, Carol calls audibles, we have the tendency to feel like we're by ourselves. We feel like we're the only one. Dion, we feel like nobody knows what we're going through. We feel that nobody has the same issue that we have. Y'all ain't hearing me. We feel no other child is like our child. No other relationship is like this relationship. We, we feel like we're in it by ourselves. The devil is a liar. I came to tell you tonight that you ain't by yourself. Help me preach. Tell somebody, neighbor, you're not by yourself. Come on, lean over. Tell them, say, neighbor, you ain't, you're not by yourself. You're, you're, not by, you're not by yourself. In the text, God sent something to Israel. Verse 21 says that they had these pillars. It was a pillar, a cloud by day. Stay with me, Rekai, a pillar, a fire by night. And this pillar never left the sight of Israel. Verse 22 of our text says that all their journey, the cloud never was out of sight. They had a constant reminder that they were not in this thing by themselves. This pillar represented two things. Number one, I'm almost done. The pillar, number one, it was designed to protect them from the elements. Somebody shout, the elements. It's no coincidence these Israelites are traveling by foot on their way out of Egypt into Canaan, and they're traveling through a hot wilderness. However, during the day, God gave them a pillar of cloud. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. They're walking through the wilderness. But as they're walking through the wilderness, they're walking in shade. Thank you, Lord. As they're walking through the wilderness, they're walking with a cloud that's blocking the heat, blocking the rays from the sun. And thank God, even at night, when the temperature dipped and they got cold, they didn't freeze to death because that pillar of cloud turned, help me somebody, into a pillar of fire. So even at night, God sent heat all day and all night. God was protecting them from the elements. Can I give 500 people a reason to shout? You ought to thank God because all 2018, God has protected somebody from the elements. Things in the elements, things in the world that could have taken you out, pestilence and disease and sicknesses. God could, could, could have taken you out, but thank God all day. And all night, God has been protected. Please don't think that you're here because you've been so careful, Lord. You've been so safe. Please don't think that you're here because uh, you have such great insurance. It was God's grace and God's mercy. I feel like preaching now that has protected you from the elements. Somebody shout the elements. 
the, this, these pillars were protecting them, number one, from the elements. Not only were the pillars protecting them from the elements, the pillars were protecting them from uh, the enemy. Somebody shout the enemy. When you drop down to chapter number 14, they're going to put it on the screen, chapter 14, around verse number 19, you'll discover uh, that the Bible says that the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud that went from before them came and stood behind them. Stop there. Let me explain what's happening in the text. Uh, Pharaoh's army now is chasing after the children of Israel. Pharaoh's army represents the past. Somebody shout the past. They were freed from the past, but in the time of the text, the past is coming after them. And because the past is gaining up on them, the past is trying to catch up with them. Look how awesome God is. The pillar that was walking or leading them change positions and the pillar now comes up behind them and the pillar gets in between Israel and their haters. Somebody oh God prays there because you ought to thank God that God has a way of keeping the past from you. That God has a way of keeping the enemy. Oh let me see if I can help you. Stand up here. I'm Steve. Come over here. I'm Jerome. Let me explain uh, what's happening in the text. Uh, uh, here it is. Uh, the past, Pharaoh's army is coming after uh, Israel. Israel has left uh, Egypt uh, and they're on their way to Canaan. Uh, there's a pillar that's leading them, but God sees that the enemy is coming up behind them. Uh, so what God decides to do is uh, God decides to change positions uh, and God gets in between uh, Israel and the enemy. He's doing it for two reasons. Uh, he's doing it, number one, uh, uh, to keep Israel from going back to their past. Uh, but he's doing it, number two, to keep the past uh, from coming after Israel. You don't know when to shout. God jumps in between uh, the enemy and Israel. He's doing it to keep Israel from going back to the past. But he's doing it to keep the past uh, from coming after Israel. Somebody in this house, oh God, a supercalifragilistic, uh, expialidocious kind of praise uh, because if the truth be told, uh, some of us would have went back to our past uh, or our past would have caught some of us. Uh, but the grace of God is so awesome uh, that God got a way of shutting some stuff down. Uh, if I'm talking to you, uh, lean over, tell somebody, neighbor, he's talking about me now because God has a way of stopping the enemy uh, from coming up to consume you. Uh, if the truth be told, uh, I should have been dead a long time ago. I should have been resting in my grave. My last lie should have been my last lie. My last sin should have been my last sin. But oh, thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. Thank God for the cloud coming in, stepping between me and my enemy. And if you can't praise God for nothing else, open up your mouth and give God a crazy praise just for how God blocked it. Give somebody high five and tell them, neighbor, God blocked it. That's the wrong neighbor. Say, neighbor, God, shut it down. God blocked it. I could have been dead. I should have lost my mind. Should have thrown in the towel. Should have waved the right flag. But the God that we serve stepped between me and the adversary. Kept me from it. Kept it from me. And now you want to know when I come to church why I can't sit down there cool, calm, and collected. You want to know when I come to church why I can't help but shout. You want to know why I can't help but run. It's because you don't know like I know what the law has done for me. You want to know when I come to church why I got to holler, why I got to yell, why I got to open up my mouth. It's because the Bible says the redeemed of the Lord all the saints So If you've been redeemed, if the Lord Lord has brought you out. If the Lord has saved you, open up your mouth, lean your head back, and tell God, thank you. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. Can I close the text? And the Bible says, God, change the route. God, change. 
change the play. God, change the plan. But I thank God he changed the plan. But he saved me. Thank God he changed the route. But he saved me. Thank God I didn't get there when I thought I would. But thank God I'm going to get there. Can you help me shout? Open up your mouth. And thank God that you're still here. Because the truth be told, you should have lost your mind. Should have thrown in the towel. Should have died last year. But open up your mouth and tell God, thank you. Thank you for changing the play. I'm wiser. I'm bigger. I'm better. I'm stronger. And I say it again. Because you changed the play. I'm stronger. I'm wiser. I'm better. I got the wrong church. And I try it one more time. Because you changed the play. I'm better. I'm wiser. I'm stronger. I'll try this side. Because you changed the play. I'm better. I'm wiser. I'm stronger. I'll try this side. Because you change the play, I'm better, I'm wiser, I'm stronger. If that's your testimony, turn to your neighbor, give them high five. Say, neighbor, I'm better, I'm wiser, I'm stronger. Tell somebody else, better, I'm better, I'm better. I'm better, I'm better, I'm better, I'm wiser, I'm wiser, but most of all, I'm stronger. Shout yes, shout yes, shout yes, yes. He changed the play. He changed the route. He called the audible. I never thought my life would be like this. Somebody never cried as much as you've cried. But oh, thank God, you're still here. We're getting ready to pray. But before we do, I need you just to wrap your arms around someone. And tell them you can handle audibles. You can survive the audible. Come on, tell them. Tell them you, you didn't do it. Tell them you can survive the play changes. You can survive the play changes. He changed the way. But I still got the word. And the word is God is going to visit me and take me to my final destination. 